Welcome everyone to this webinar hosted by Tordex entitled Create Rich UIs with Crank Storyboard on NXP i.mx8. We have as with us today our guest and partner, Crank Software. Before we begin some notes, there will be a Q&A section at the end of the webinar. However, throughout the webinar, you can type your questions in the GoToWebinar tool and we will get to them at the end. Also, please use the webinar chat to report any technical issues so that we may resolve them in a timely manner. Finally, we will provide a public recording of this webinar at a later date. So let us begin. My name is Jeremiah Cordoba. I'm an embedded systems engineer at Tordex, and from Crank Software, we have Jason Clark, VP and co-founder, as well as Gary Clarkson, a FAE who will be presenting the main topic of the webinar today. Now, just a quick intro about Tordex for people who may be unfamiliar with what we do. In short, we make easy to use embedded computing solutions. We do this by providing reliable ARM-based system on modules along with the software. Tordex achieves this by providing a low cost to ownership, meaning reduced time to develop, market, and maintenance for the customer. We also have an active community site and developer site with documentation from all our developers. Finally, we have a dedicated global team of FEEs that provide support as well as do videos and webinars such as these. We at Tordex service a broad range of industries. However, we do have our key markets as you can see listed here on the slide. Also, it helps to know our typical annual volumes as you can also see listed here on the slide. As for our product portfolio, we provide two families of system on modules Calibri and Apollos. The Calibri is a smaller form factor that is more cost and power sensitive, while the Apollos is a larger form factor with more powerful and modern interfaces. Our modules are pin compatible within each family, meaning you can easily upgrade or downgrade the hardware as you evaluate. Our SOC providers are NXP mainly with the i.mx line of products, but we also have some products from NVIDIA, with SOCs like the T20 and TK1. Of course, our software comes free with the hardware such as Terizon, which I will talk a bit about now. Terizon is a new easy to use industrial Linux platform created by Tordex. Other than the features listed here, the main driving point behind Terizon is the ease of use. In the context of this webinar, that means with Terizon, developers will be able to focus more on their application rather than having to deal with the underlying details of their OS. Here we have a quick list of the technology stack that's included with Terizon. The Terizon OS is based on Linux micro platforms by Foundries.io, another one of our partners. Like most embedded OSs, Terizon is built using the Octo project. Terizon also features a container runtime engine provided by Docker, which is a key point of this webinar. Using containers, we plan to provide a rich ecosystem of partner containers, such as the Crank container that will be featured in this webinar. By default, Terizon will have a Debian-based container for a simple out-of-the-box experience that is familiar to most Linux users who may not be familiar with embedded devices. Tordex also plans to provide integration for most popular IDEs and frameworks, making development smooth and easy. Finally, Terizon will also feature various development tools that will also simplify the process. So in short, Terizon, as you can see here, architecture-wise, is a very minimal Linux kernel, as I said, built with the Octo project. Its main features is the Docker engine, which provides a container runtime and an over-the-air update client that is automotive grade. Most importantly, all software that is built in Terizon is open source. Terizon itself can be easily installed onto any compatible Tordex module using our Tordex Easy Installer, which comes pre-installed on all our modules. Now, before we move on, we're gonna have a quick poll. You'll have about 10 seconds to answer the poll and then we'll continue with the presentation. All right, it seems like most people aren't very familiar with the concept of software containerization, which is good because that's what I'm going to explain next. 
So let me elaborate a bit on the idea of containers for those who may be unfamiliar with the concept as it'll be vital for Crank's main presentation. In short, containers can be thought of as a lightweight virtual machine. It provides an alternate environment that can run on top of your base OS. As the name suggests, this environment is an isolated package designed to be portable between machines. For Terizon, we use containers as an alternative way to package and distribute software applications. The end result is a highly portable application that carries its dependencies with it, thereby eliminating much of the dependency burden on the OS itself. Here we have a comparison between how a system on a traditional Linux OS compares to what we have on Terizon. As you can see, the main difference is that the various processes as well as their respective file systems are within containers. The processes represent one's application while the file system is everything that an application requires in order to run. With the traditional OS, all the layers are heavily intertwined requiring careful management of the overall OS over the lifetime of a project. Containers guarantee that an application will always have the right dependencies, thereby removing the well-known dependency hell that can arise with development. Also, since each container is isolated from one another, you can have two different versions of the same library on one system by packaging them in different containers, something that would be quite difficult to manage on a traditional OS. So just to summarize, the purpose of running containers in Terizon is to put the focus back on application development. By packaging your applications within containers, you have less dependencies and management overhead on the OS while having greater control over your application and the environment that ships with it. Also, since we use Docker as our container engine, this provides access to Docker Hub a large repository of container images that can provide a base for any project, greatly speeding up application development. This is also where Tordex and partner-affiliated container images can be found. For further information on containers and how they're used in Terizon, we also have a previously recorded webinar titled Introducing Terizon that can be found on our website or the Tordex YouTube channel. So now let me go ahead and introduce our partner, Crank Software, who will show how containers can be used for application development. Jason Clark will now take you on a deeper dive into this topic, but if you have any questions during the webinar, please ask your questions in the question dialogue of GoToWebinar, and we have a Q&A section at the end. We're also interested to hear your feedback about this webinar. There's a survey you can fill out at the end and I encourage you to reach out to either of us to tell us about your projects, requirements, or feature wish lists. And let us know if you're facing any unresolved challenges. A recording of this webinar will be available in the next week or so at tordex.com slash webinars or at the YouTube on the Tordex channel. So without further ado, I welcome Jason Clark of Crank Software. Thanks, Jeremiah. Um, so I'm Jason Clark. I'm one of the co-founders here at Crank Software. I would just give you a quick little overview of what we're going to do here today, and then we can uh, move along to the meat of the subject here. So I'm just going to quickly walk over who Crank Software is, uh, why, why we came to be, what, what were the motivations, uh, what our tool is, and then Gary's going to walk through a demo showing you how Storyboard can easily be used on the Terizon platform with Tordex. Crank Software is an embedded UI and development company providing services and embedded software. Our goal and purpose is to accelerate the next embedded UI experience. Um, we have lots of customers out in the field today, and you're probably already interfacing with a lot of our customers, and you may not even know Here are just a handful of some of our bigger customers, um, as uh, some of the brand names you've already seen, and you may have interfaced with them before but we're helping lots of customers at all different stages. So, so here you see some Fortune 500 companies, but we're dealing with so many small and medium-sized businesses and really helping them bring a rich user interface to life on these embedded products. We cover multiple markets. Uh, we have customers in automotive, smart home, medical, industrial. Um, they're really all over the place, anywhere where they're building embedded devices. The problem is the same that we're seeing, is the expectation is so high now when somebody touches the glass of an embedded device 
that they're expecting, that same cell phone experience they get everywhere else. So everybody's having the same problem in every market where how do they move from these design concepts they have through to the engineering team and make them come to life? So Crank Software has been doing this for 12 years now as a company. Um, the team that started it, uh, myself included, have a rich background in embedded systems. We're headquartered in Ottawa, Canada, and we have sales teams and distributors throughout the world. So if you're looking to engage, uh, we have people in most regions around the world who can uh, get in touch with you and show you off uh, what we can do here. As I mentioned, we are a product and services company. Um, so I'll just quickly touch on the services side of it and then move back to the product. Um, we do do services on the user interface and this is our world. Um, we write from design through to development and prototyping and testing and optimization all through all those different areas. We help our customers, big and small, get to market inside of here. But our main focus on this help is with our storyboard development software. So Storyboard is a UI development tool. It allows designers and engineers to come together in a single space to build embedded UIs. It runs on Mac, Linux, and Windows, so all the different environments. It's a full-featured IDE that allows you a single tool to reach all the different targets from an MCU all the way up to the richest powered MPUs with 3D graphics. The reason for why we did this was we were seeing so many problems and what was happening in the embedded space was, especially with the introduction of the phone and the expectations growing all the time, um, the teams were changing a lot on how an embedded device came to be. Um, you know, if you go back 10 years or so, the engineering team would just take a basic idea of the requirements and start coding and develop everything themselves. Well, nowadays there's design teams, there's UI, and designers personnel, there's UX, there's project managers. But even on top of that, there's a whole level of people that are very concerned and have opinions on the user interface itself because it is the face of the product. So what we saw so many times is the design concepts were not being realized. They didn't have the ability to deal with iteration as the design was coming through. So, you know, they would create the initial idea of what the UI should look like, but then they started doing customer testing, senior management would come along, tell them that changes need to be happen. And all that is very problematic with the engineering tools that were designed for um, sort of an older way that UIs were being built. So what ended up happening was a compromised product ended up going to market because they couldn't manage all this change and they sort of would take the feedback and do some of it and depending how hard it was. And a lot of this was just because there's a total different set of priorities that the design teams have and the engineering teams have. One is really worried about the experience, the look, the feel, um, maybe a little looser tied to how the system comes together and the performance of the processor and such, while the engineering team is very tied to, you know, um, reliability, performance, um, code reuse, size, memory. Um, so not that these things can't come together, but it's a little bit hard when people are looking at it different ways. So we wanted to make a tool that brought these two worlds together. So this is where the idea for Crank Storyboard came from. It was to simplify the workflow between designers and developers and create a clean architecture where they can both work at what they are best at and have an easy way for the two worlds to come together to test and verify and get it to market. And the one thing we really wanted to do, which we didn't see in the market, was make sure that we embrace the idea of iteration. The idea that your UI isn't going to iterate throughout the development process um, is very rare. Um, so with our storyboard product, when we came back to it, we wanted to make sure we pulled in the design files so we can import Photoshop files, but we go one step beyond anybody else who does this. We actually do a full re-import of Photoshop files. And what this means is, as the design changes and um, you know feedbacks coming in, the designers are going to make changes and iterations to those Photoshop files. Well, a lot of times this can cause, depending on how big those changes are, the design, the development team to almost go back to the start and start building up the UI again. With Storyboard, you can actually re-import the Photoshop file and merge in the changes and design ideas, and it will grab in the new imagery, update positions, update new assets. Along with that, we wanted to make sure that there was a way that we could actually compare and merge between these changes as we're allowing designers to work inside of our teams. We needed to make a graphical 
compare and merge tool so people can actually see the change to the UI, not at a code or syntax level, but at a graphical level so they can start identifying what has changed in the UI and what are the ramifications of those changes. Along with that, some of the other key pieces we did was building a very rich animation timeline that allowed our design teams to start coming in and define very um, large animations and not so much in size, but in subtlety. Um, you know, when designers build animations and tools like After Effects and other tools of that nature, there's a lot of subtle movements to build up the UI and make it feel really rich and strong. We needed to open that and allow the designers to have that same control. And this is what we did inside of our timeline, allowing them to change the rates to custom rates, allow them to step through each step of the animation and get the exact anticipated animation they wanted to build. And after all that, the next thing is to make sure that they can test and validate it very quickly on the hardware that's right in front of them. So one story of where we saw this come together awesomely with Toradex was a medical customer. Um, they were going to their next generation. They had multiple products they wanted to get to market in the future. They were working through the different experiences and UIs that they needed to implement on this. And at the same time, they were trying to decide what was the hardware platform they would need underneath this to make it happen. And the combination of Crank Software and, and Toradex really made this possible. They were looking at some versions where they had a simpler UI and they were able to use the same baseboard with different SOM modules. They started with an IMX7 for some of their simpler UIs and just with a software render, but then they were able to scale up to it at that time an IMX6 to get the advantages of the OpenGL renderer. And this allowed the customer to really compress their time, understand the user experience they wanted to provide to their customers and also help them select the hardware platform and go to market with the uh, combination of the two of us. Um, and this was super powerful. So the combination of the two of us, we have so many things when you hear uh, what we talk about. It's all about faster time to market, easier validation and scalability across markets. So um, the two solutions come together really nicely. Rather than me go on and on about this at the high level uh, marketing side, we're gonna have Gary Clarkson walk through a live demo, our storyboard apps. So he's first gonna walk through how we can pull down a Docker image on the Horizon platform, and then he'll show you the next steps of what you could do after that by downloading the 30-day eval on our website and try something out yourself. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, so it's actually surprisingly simple, this, um, this step. Uh, we we really play into the strengths of using uh, using an off-shelf uh, solutions such as the uh, the um, Toradex dev boards. Um, the hardware really is up to speed and, and very fast uh, at getting started. Um, if you add on top of that the capabilities of the, the Docker uh, and the container subsystems, um, it really makes it very cool to uh, to get something up and running. So, so what we've done is pre-prepared this uh, this base image from the uh, distribution servers uh, that uh, are hosted by Toradex. So, um, when you first power the board up, you'll get a UI such as this from the Easy Installer. You simply go down and pick the Horizon Core image with Docker pre-installed, um, and you'll have to tick the uh, the continuous integration server option there uh, and pull down the latest. So uh, there are some full instructions in a web page that's uh, been hosted on the Toradex knowledge base. So you'll be able to do this yourself uh, if you have Toradex hardware. Um, with a Toradex uh, IMX8 SOM, uh, this is an Apalis IMX8 SOM fitted to my board here. Um, it's underneath the heatsink. Um, the board itself is an Exora um, baseboard. So what I'm gonna do now is, uh, you can see here I've got a few cables connected, got power, um, down here, I've got the uh, the, the serial co console cable, um, Ethernet, uh, and down at the bottom there is uh, is a USB cable. I'm going to use this for the uh, the Toradex live installer. Uh, I've also got a mouse attached. So uh, you see the, the the small link at the top in the top corner uh, is going to put it into uh, bootloader mode when I power on. So if I kick that off. So Toradex supply a, uh, if I flick over to my uh, my desktop screen, Toradex supply a utility called the Easy Installer Loader. Um, if I run this, what this is going to do is uh, it's going to connect to the board and download a custom bootloader. Um, you can see here that it's actually now bus booting into Linux. Uh, this is, is going to start up on the target board. Um, 
and uh, hopefully at that point uh, easy installer is now up and running so uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, now it's bootstrapped I can show you the screen um, zoom in a little bit okay so uh, with the uh, easy installer you have the ability to install lots of different images um, so what we have here is a list of the default ones um, I'm going to now enable the feeds um, feeds option let me just move the camera up slightly uh, the feeds option here is um, that's going to uh, switch on the integration feeds uh, from the overnight built so we're going to pull down um, one of the uh, one of the images it's a Horizon core image uh, and this is going to have uh, docker pre-installed so you see here down at the bottom uh, we're going to be uh, refreshing with the latest from the, uh, the the last night's builds so we'll pull down um, a, a Horizon core image with docker pre-installed and I think the latest one I can see there is uh, is from the uh, is build 325 from the 14th um, so let's go ahead and kick that off uh, I'm going to say yes there. This is going to uh, reflash the board with uh, with a completely new system image uh, pulled down afresh from the Horizon web server. So when this has been, been uh, fully installed, uh, we're going to be able to remove the jumper. Um, so f take it out of forced bootload mode uh, and it should hopefully uh, boot back into the uh, new image, the Horizon image that we're just installing. So when that's all complete, we should get a dialog box up to tell us to reboot, which is there we go. Uh, it's a little, little difficult for you to see on the uh, on the webcam, but uh, what I'll do is remove the jumper. And now we will uh, power off the board. So if I flip back to my desktop, you'll see here that uh, we're now going to hit the power on button and we should see a, uh, a nice standard Linux boot. I'm going to get rid of the easy installer we're not using now. So if, uh, when you have your board, you'll see the uh, the Horizon image coming up. Um, this is going to be it's going to be booting straight into an operating system, uh, but it's a it's a fairly basic empty operating system image. So um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to we're going to pull down some uh, some Docker containers. So we're going to install them um, and we're going to uh, build up our system bit by bit. So the first step here is uh, by default you need to log in and the the standard uh, username is Horizon with a Z and the password is Horizon. Now first time through it's going to make you change the password so you have to enter Horizon again oh, let me do that again uh, Horizon Okay, I'm going to choose a, a nice simple password. I'm going to use root R W O T because it's easy to type. So what we got now is uh, we got a base image which is up and running. Um, it has Docker installed, but there are no containers. So if I show you the first uh, the first level here, so Docker images, um, and that's going to show you um, basically that there's nothing installed that's very much an empty operating system um, so what we need now is to is to overlay that with um, you know a, a basic uh, user interface framework and um, for for this demo we're going to be using Western uh, and in particular the Wayland compositor so we often get questions regarding uh, Western in terms of what is it and why why do I need this um, for those who've done some software development with Linux in the past, uh, you may have been familiar with X server. So in the latest Linux distros, uh, the X server is being phased out in favor of Wayland. Uh, and this is becoming increasingly uh, the case. So if you're using um, you know, Ubuntu or one of the latest platforms, then you'll be, uh, you'll be looking to use Wayland. So here we're going to be using a Debian based image. Um, and again, this is one of the standard uh, Toradex hosted images on the uh, the container on the Docker Hub. Um, and in this case, it's it's actually the Buster, 
release. So it's a Debian buster uh, containing the Western framework. Uh, and this is a client server model. Um, so we're, we, have, um, we have infrastructure which talks to this platform. Um, in this case, the, uh, the Western container also includes a lot of the OpenGL um, drivers and graphics acceleration runtime. So the IMX platform we're using today uh, has, a, has a GPU on board and we're going to make use of that. So a uh, simple second step, uh, I can show you that actually in practice now. So, uh, and the second part now is, uh, is when we're going to be um, bringing up the board with uh, some containers. So you can see on the, uh, the screen here that we've, uh, we've booted to our desktop. And uh, if I flip back to my desktop, uh, I've got a couple of windows here. Um, the first one will be uh, the serial console window. So uh, here we are connected to the target board by the, uh, the UART. And, um, and I, I've got some, uh, some additional commands here that I'm going to use to type in. So the first step really is to uh, commission the operating system on the board. So um, we're going to, uh, on this IMX8 Apollo module, we're going to be installing um, a 64-bit version of the Debian Western um, container. And this is going to uh, have the Vivanti uh, GPU acceleration in board. So uh, you can see here where we're going to set that to be restart always and uh, we're going to be logging in with user uh, root. So let me go ahead and install that. So you'll see here that uh, the first thing it does is uh, is pull down all of these images live. So uh, because this is uh, there's uh, an empty image really, um, we're pulling down a, a, a base image with uh, with essentially the, the, the same as what you'd find if you installed a, a, a base desktop image with say Ubuntu. So this is going to have um, this is going to have the the Western Display Manager and uh, and the um, platform is going to have all of the graphics drivers ready for us. But st at this point, we're not going to have any applications loaded. So now uh, the second step is complete. We've now got the Debian Western image on the board, and uh, and if I show you Docker PS. You can see it's running now. Uh, it's been up from 10 seconds. So that's the, uh, the really the second step, and this is going to allow us to to now deploy containers on top of uh, this platform, uh, which are going to be making use of the graphics subsystem. Uh, and then the last step, which I'll show you next, is to pull down and run the storyboard container. Now we host this again on the Docker Hub. You can go and see this yourself. Um, pull this down and investigate. Um, our Storyboard container is much smaller. It uh, it only has uh, links to the dependencies for the OpenGL and such, uh, but it also includes our storyboard engine and some utilities and other applications that we use. Um, a whole bunch of libraries for uh, the storyboard AO and Lua and various other things. Uh, most of the features inside storyboard are uh, implemented as plugins, so you can include or, or exclude these as, as you need. And these include things like animation, media, um, 3D, um, 3D model support and 3D rotation, various other 3D effects, together with a, a launcher script, which, uh, which is basically configuring um, the device interfaces for storyboard, um, mainly the uh, which which screen you're going to be using, and also which interface for inputs such as the touchscreen. Um, so the next step in our bring up is going to be involving uh, deploying a, a custom um, application, uh, a new application down to the board. So previously we've we've installed the base uh, Western image, we've overlaid that with the the storyboard um, uh, Horizon IMX8 6.1 runtime in a, in a storyboard container, uh, Docker. Docker container. Um, now we're going to, uh, you see here, if I flip back to my uh, my screen, uh, we've been running the uh, the medical application which comes with the uh, the storyboard Docker image by default. Um, so what I want to do is replace that. So if I look at my uh, my desktop now, I can do uh, Control P Q to drop out of that. Uh, if I do Docker P S. I can see we've still got our two of our Docker containers running. I need to stop the storyboard container and then I'm going to deploy a new application and start it again. So to do that, you do Docker stop and I'm going to use the name, uh, the ID of that image. And that's going to bring it down gracefully. Um, so it's going to stop the uh, stop the second Horizon uh, IMX8 container. 
There we go. And uh, just to prove that that's actually worked, I'm going to do Docker PS. So now we've still got uh, just our base Debian Western container, and this, the uh, storyboard container on top of that has been has been temporarily halted. So um, if I bring up uh, here storyboard, so storyboard is the uh, is the Crank Software application desktop. Um, one of the things I want to do is uh, show you. Uh, let me show you uh, another application that we're going to deploy. So. Uh, here is a home automation application that we've uh, we put together for uh, for demonstrating you know 3D graphics and various other things. Um, so I can I can run this on my desktop. Uh, this is uh, it's going to launch in a uh, simulation window here, and um, it's a very nice application. It uh, it allows you to uh, to explore and uh, really engage with uh, with a model. Um, we're using some 3D graphics here, some really cool graphics to, to kind of show you uh, show the application. Um, here I can interact with it. I can say maybe change the lighting um, and that sort of stuff. So uh, it's a pretty uh, pretty full featured application. Um, really, it's going to show off some of the 3D capabilities of the IMX8. Um, so what I've got here is the uh, is the the desktop uh, application simulated on my desktop. What I can do now is deploy that to my target board. Um, and I happen to know that's on uh, IP address 192.168.0.75. Uh, here we're using the SCP transfer uh, mode of, of Storyboard. I'm going to deploy my model and all of these assets to the Storyboard folder here. Uh, we saw earlier how we created this folder. So this is on the target image. Um, the SCP folder is going to be the repository for all of our images and, um, and our models and on our, our 3D um, assets. So let me go ahead and uh, apply that and deploy that. So that's going to be uh, downloading um, the the files here. If I show you the, the navigator view uh, for the 3D house, and that's completed. So uh, the 3D house, uh, in, in in fact, is a bunch of files. Here's our application model. Uh, you can see here that uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, PNGs. Uh, these are the, the visual assets. Uh, and in this one, we've even got some uh, some 3D 3D models here. Um, so these are uh, these are created using a 3D tool, uh, and we're going to deploy them. Okay, so uh, that application which was running in Storyboard now uh, should now be on the target. So uh, what I can do is I can kick that off again, and uh, still using our same command that we used before. So this is uh, launching the Storyboard Docker container. It's going to be looking at the uh, the crank folder here that we deployed uh, our application to just now and um, let me kick that off and run it and uh, when I switch to our video camera view we should see that application now has just launched and started running on the target and again I can I can now make use of all of these nice 3D graphics uh, application elements uh, I can bring up some of the uh, some of the UIs that I was looking at before, and uh, now we've uh, literally deployed a new application to the to the uh, the board, uh, and that's as simple as copying a bunch of files. So you can see really how um, how e how easy it is to get up and running with Storyboard on uh, on an uh, on a platform such as the IMX8, and uh, the out of the box experience with the Horizon uh, Docker containers and the uh, the core images from the uh, the Horizon websites um, are really uh, very simple uh, and there's a few easy steps to get you up and running in no time. So uh, if you have this hardware, I suggest you uh, give it a try. So what I'm going to show you is the next step really is to is to show you a, a, a typical workflow that works for our customers. Um, so in this case, if I uh, just bring up Storyboard as a application. So, um, so there, are, there are different ways of doing this. Uh, this particular uh, workflow is going to be based on an import from Photoshop. So uh, if I show you um, Photoshop here, uh, so this is something we one of our designers has created. Uh, it's um, it's kind of a, a desktop uh, representation of, uh, of a home heating controller, I guess. Um, so it has a, a bunch of screens, maybe four screens there. Uh, and this is using uh, standard Photoshop and, and a technique called um, artboards. So uh, each one of these screens is models as an artboard. And you can see if I pull out the layers here, uh, that it's, it's architect and built just as you would imagine. So the bottom layer, 
uh, is the background if I turn that on and off uh, and then on top of that we've got the, uh, the kind of content layer in the middle and this top layer is a is a shared navigation element which is common to all the screens so what we can simply do is is import the Photoshop model uh, straight from the PSD file uh, here's one I was just looking at uh, what that's going to do is going to it's going to import that that PSD file. Uh, I should say you don't actually need Photoshop to do this. We're able to pick apart the PSD file format and recreate it in Storyboard. Uh, I'm going to create this in this case into a brand new project called Home Automation. So as part of this step, we're going to be picking apart all of the elements and recreating them uh, in a hierarchy in a model inside Storyboard. So you should see here that um, if I zoom out slightly. We've got, a, we've got all our uh, four screens and uh, we've got all of the graphical elements. Uh, we've individual images have come in as, uh, as images. And if I flick from the, the model view, which is similar to what we see in, in Photoshop to the actual asset view, uh, we can see here in our project, we've got a whole bunch of images here where these are uh, these are the, the elements in the Photoshop file that we've, we've taken apart and recreated. And you can start working with these images and adding animations. And uh, we've got our, our, uh, our files and everything else. Uh, here is the, the model we've created as well. So this is the, the metadata, the positioning information about all of these assets. So in Storyboard, we, uh, everything is, a, is a, a event driven. So when we're not doing anything, when we're not running an animation or, or, uh, or maybe a, a processing a timer, we're not actually using processor power. So we're actually fully stateless. Uh, we sit there and wait for an event. So in this case, what I'm going to do is add some very quickly, some navigation to this application. It'd be, be quite helpful if we we're able to move around and to change the screen. So I can do this by adding uh, an action, a trigger to this icon here, which is the, uh, the climate icon. Uh, in this case, I'm going to do a, a touch. So uh, this is triggered by a touch on the icon. Um, and I want to do a screen transition. And in this case, let's do a screen path. Uh, and I'll pick the climate screen. So you can see here, we're able to set frames per second. Uh, this is 30 frames per second in this case. You can choose any number you like. Um, you're in full control of all of this. And you can go and change it later. Uh, and I'm going to say uh, let's uh, let's instead of doing all the layers, we'll uh, we'll save some processing power and just doing the delta. So we'll do a kind of a, a, a compositing diff there and direction. Let's go from the left. Okay, so you'll see here that I've I've now got an extra trigger event uh, linked with that action. So I can quickly take that and copy it to the other three um, navigation options here. In this case, uh, let's look at the, uh, the security one. So I'm going to make that transition to the security screen. And similarly with the uh, calendar. And finally with the settings. So if I just save that now. Um, what that's done is is added the navigation, and uh, we we actually really encourage the the designers, the industrial design teams, the graphic guys to do this themselves. It doesn't require code to do this; it's it's metadata, um, and it's uh, it's really easy for them to do with a little bit of training we offer to uh, to get really quite a long way through the design prototyping process without having to generate code. Uh, and one of the real powers of using Storyboard is that I can now simulate that on my desktop. Um, so I just clicked on the uh, the simulate storyboard screen, which uh, has come up on my second monitor here. So we've now got uh, an application which is running on the Windows 32 x86 um, OpenGL accelerated version of our runtime. Uh, you can see here we've got some behaviors already. And here's the navigation characteristics that I added myself. And again, this probably looks a bit choppy on the uh, on the webinar because of the uh, the, the web link, but uh, this is a nice smooth kind of carousel transition between screens, and that's that's been added very quickly. Okay, so I think um, that's all I was going to show you today. Uh, if I flick back to the uh, the application, um, the end of the demo is uh, is is now, and uh, I think. Um, 
what we're going to do now is switch to a um, bit of a, an overview and a Q&A session uh, in the last maybe 15 minutes or so. What I should say is uh, before I before we do that, um, I'll give you a quick preview of, um, of the website. Um, this is uh, this is where we're staging the, uh, the the Docker container on the Docker Hub, so you can go and pull that down. Uh, we've got a link as well. Uh, and Torex are hosting this uh, this basically step by step guide on their uh, their knowledge base. So I encourage you, if you have some hardware, to uh, to go off and, uh, and get this up and running. Uh, it really is maybe a 10, 15 minute job. And, uh, it's uh, something really cool. So again, all of the uh, all of the different uh, hardware platforms we support, different versions of the display. Um, I'm using a, a DVI connect, an LVDS connected display now, but uh, many customers are are evaluating with uh, with one of the the standalone touchscreen HDMI connected monitors. It's uh, equally as good. Um, and again, all of the all the various steps that I did live are, are listed for you here. So uh, this should help you to get up and running. I think we're going to switch back to the uh, Q and A session. Um, I leave it on this slide and open the floor. Of course, you uh, you probably do need storyboards to, uh, to 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 start messing with your own designs here. Uh, we do have a bunch of um, samples included, and you can go and get a free trial from the uh, the uh, the storyboard uh, um, download on the Crank Software website. All right. So I think with our time left over now, we'll go ahead and start with our Q and A section. We'll go ahead and start with the questions that were already asked during the presentation, but feel free to ask further questions as we go through the current questions. So, uh, Gary, I think there's a question for you. Uh, what happens if you don't have a GPU on the hardware you're running crank? Okay, so um, because of the way that Storyboard runs, we have a runtime engine. Um, so this is personalized to the, the actual target hardware. Um, so if, uh, if you take a look at our, uh, our runtime files, there, there's, there's basically an element, which is which operating system you're using, um, which physical hardware, like the IMX8, for example, um, and also which graphics rendering technology. Um, so that combination makes up a runtime um, image. So we have obviously the Wayland OpenGL ones that we were using today, but uh, for many platforms, uh, we also, in fact, every platform, we have a, a software render uh, version of that. So it's entirely software rendering. Um, so we don't rely on any GPU hardware. Um, and so this is able to run on pretty much anything. Um, we have actually yeah, find this is very useful for, uh, as, as Jason mentioned in, in one of the samples, um, sample customer scenarios before we we get customers where they really don't know which hardware they need so they'll uh, they'll maybe have a one of the Toradex Calibri modules for an IMX7 ULL or uh, IMX6 ULL or IMX7 or you know maybe a IMX6 quad core and IMX8 and run them side by side um, and decide whether whether they need GPU or not whether they can get a cheaper device um, or whether they do really need a, a in a hardware acceleration so we have a separate runtime for each um, combination of OS target and uh, and indeed graphics rendering so hopefully that answers the question. Okay, and then our next question is also for Crank. Is an OS with a smaller footprint supported by Crank? For example, free RTOS or Zephyr? Uh, shall I take that, Jason? <laughs> sure, go ahead, Gary. Sure. Uh, the answer is uh, yes. So. Um, we, we've shown running on Linux here, so uh, we also support uh, QNX, we also support um, Windows Embedded, so Windows CE. Uh, and increasingly, uh, we're, we're moving much further down into the microcontroller territory as well. So um, on platforms, um, including uh, you know, the IMX RT and other, other kind of essentially Cortex-M class platforms, we support um, operating systems um, for you know, real hard uh, free autos based operating system something like um, net uh, integrity uh, we've got UCOS 2 and 3 um, you know real real autos platform so not without an operating system in fact uh, we can even run without uh, without file systems as well so this is real uh, flash based um, so yes we we go down to cortex m4 and m7 uh, we use free autos uh, and other other operating systems 
Uh, the, the main dependency for us really are, are some basic uh, basic uh, OS constructs, such as uh, the concept of a task, um, memory management, um, some of the semaphores, and, and crucially queues. We use queues to send messages between uh, between the uh, the tasks. So as long as uh, an operating system is able to do that, we've we've got to, we've got the ability to run on it. Okay. Um, let's see the next question. I can probably answer this one. Uh, which Tordex platforms does Crank currently run on? So we have this information on our knowledge base page about this webinar. So far, we have it at for the IMX6, IMX7, and IMX8. And all of these platforms also do have a compatible compatibility with Terizon. So, okay, the next question, and for Crank again, uh, how does my code communicate with the UI slash hardware? I'll take this one, Gary. Um, <laughs> um, so Crank software, as Gary mentioned, is a runtime engine, and so we're not compiling code each time that the user does something. Um, we do this by creating a model. Um, so there isn't code built in inherently. We do have a Lewis scripting engine, and in some places we do have customers who put code in when we go to very small platforms and a scripting engine doesn't fit. Um, but by default, what the users do is they use the scripting engine to manage the sort of UI area of logic and uh, what they need to manage in the UI, but they we try and push customers to a nice clean solution where they separate their UI and their business logic. So the business logic is probably in C code or C++ or however they might be managing all that other information for how their product really works. And just sending events to the storyboard application and receiving events from us back. So this is all done over our communication channel called Storyboard.io. Um, Storyboard.io is a messaging system that goes across any uh, any. Uh, any of the operating systems we support it allows customers to serialize a message, send data, and have it implemented on the other side, and then also receive data back from the UI, depending on the user's changes or feedback on the uh, requested changes to the UI. Um, so th this pushes customers or you know enables customers to make sure they do create a nice clean UI. Separating the UI and the business logic we feel is imperative to design iteration, um, and allowing the design team to move forward without the system team being in lockstep and serializing the development platform. So we find this really helps our customers um, take their uh, their timelines to a much faster pace where they can get to market a lot quicker. And in fact, we, um, we, we provide um, a, a library that you link into your code, which is basically uh, the pipe. Uh, you can send and receive messages, and it's very straightforward. Um, so yes, it's uh, it's implemented in the back end as a, a shared library that you link. Okay, and let's see. Our next question is has to do with development with Crank. Um, the person asks, how long does it take for one person to create the GUI shown in the demo? Um, the GUI shown that so the original GUIs were actually. So this is a really neat thing about what we've done here. To um, the 3D house and the medical demo that you saw were all done by a single person. Um, that's one of our graphic designers in house, and this is where you know we uh, we live what we preach. All our demos are actually done by graphic designers uh, that aren't coming from the code um, world. So they are all sitting there building their Photoshop files and doing the entire demos. And this is. One of the reasons we feel our demos look uh, so good is because we're able to allow our design team to just sit there and work away at it. Um, as far as those ones, it's always hard to compare this to a real customer, but those are probably done in the order of uh, a week's with iteration on uh, the designs for those things, but um, it's not a fair comparison to a real product because we're not building any back end. So, but I do believe that we are still uh, rapid speed faster than uh, the other solutions in the market just because of the uh, once you unhinge the requirement to write all that code and back end and build it um, you know it allows your UI to move at a rapid pace and what people don't always realize is what comes out of that is if you're not waiting for that you can have the UI built 
and ready to interact through the messaging API much earlier. You can already be testing the UI through the event API, but this allows you to start getting user feedback on the real product in a real scenario a lot faster and easier. Um, rather than waiting for all the code and all the system ends to come together before you get that feedback. And I've seen this in so many different applications through my career where late in the design process is where the feedback starts coming in because it took the engineering team because they were building both ends at the same time a long time for the entire product to be realized. And then, you know, within a month of release day, feedback starts coming in from and senior management and such and it's very hard to deal with that when you're so close to a release date when you're able to really speed up that development of the UI and seeing things as fast as you can with crank software you know we really push that way up front as to be able to test out the uh, concepts and ideas in the UI okay and let's see our next question is, has to do with the storyboard ID so person is asking the storyboard ID looks similar to Eclipse or QNX ID. Is that where it comes from or is based off of? Yeah, the the framework that we are built upon is the Eclipse framework. So which is the same framework that um, QNX uses, Wind River uses, um, NXP uses in their MCU Expresso uh, platforms. Um, so it's a, a very popular framework. Um, it does provide a lot of functionality, especially when you get into collaboration and other back end pieces. Um, so it is very powerful, and that is exactly what we are using. And then let's see another question about the storyboard. Let's see, how does storyboard store the GUI in the file format. I saw .gde files. Are they similar to QML or .ui or XAML files from Microsoft? Person is asking about the file format. Is he's wondering about the file format portability to other platforms such as Qt or Microsoft or Windows Embedded? So we have multiple ways of storing our solution. So the GDE file that you saw in the demo while Gary was showing that, that is our representation in the tool and we keep a lot more information inside of there um, that we don't put in the embedded target just because it's not required. Um, when we go to target, we have multiple formats we can use. Um, we do have our standard one, which we call a gap file, which is really just stands for graphical application way before our product even had a name, we called it that. and. It is really an XML file. The difference between when you say QML and XAML and stuff, we do not have our users sitting in a text edit window editing the UI. If you are working with the UI, you are working in the UI window, you're working in the animation timeline view, you're working with the assets. Our customers don't edit the GDE file or the GAP file directly. We manage that for you. Um, you know, We didn't want to give designers and our other users you know, just the idea of taking them away from writing C code just to give them a different syntax to us didn't make sense. We wanted to make sure that we manage it. So yes, we do still store stuff in a format such as that, um, you know, and a little customization on our back end. Uh, but um, it's not a format that our users are in sitting there trying to learn the syntax and, you know, working inside of a text editor to work with. Um, we also do go out to other formats because we go down to small targets like the MCUs. We can actually go out in a, a pure header file format. We go to Android. We go to uh, different backend systems. So from our GDE file format, we do have multiple options inside of there. Um, but that, that basic is similar but different. <laughs> Okay, next question, um, so let's see, can you provide examples on the scripting side? Not sure if you know what that means, Jason or Gary. Um, yeah, Gary could probably bring up something, but at the end of the day, what our scripting is is Lua. So if you're familiar with the Lua scripting engine, that is what we use for how we script. So Gary has an example up there. Um, it is completely syntax highlighted code completion. You can test with it. You can do, uh, there's multiple different hooks. Lua, if you're not familiar with it, is a uh, an engine uh, for scripting. It mainly came out of the gaming world because uh, video games were really hard to compile and um, to make small changes when they're trying to different things and different concepts and ideas, they wanted to open up the idea of how they change variables. And Lua gave that experience. Why we use Lua is because it's, 
super fast, it's very lightweight, and it's really well documented how you go in and out of C code and extend it yourself and bring in extensions and modules. Um, you know, a lot of uh, people who provided scripting we saw in the past use things like JavaScript, but JavaScript um, or other versions of it that they've uh, used was very heavyweight, um, a lot of issues with debugging. It wasn't as clean how you moved in and out. They've done a lot of work on it since, and you see that all the time with uh, different guys like Google always trying to make it a bit better, but it is a heavyweight solution, especially if you're trying to scale down to some of the smaller platforms. Okay, Let's see, next question. Can you use Crank with the QNX OS? Uh, definitely. Um, so myself being one of the co-founders and the other two co-founders, just to give you some context, we all worked at QNX for over 10 years. Um, our head of R&D was the head of the tools and kernel team, and our president was the head of the graphics team at QNX. So <laughs> QNX and us are pretty uh, tight um, from our background, and we've always supported them. But QNX is one of the many operating systems. Gary rattled off a bunch, but... Um, we pretty much support any common platform out there right now, whether it's Android, iOS, Linux, QNX, Wind River, Green Hills, uh, Free RTOS, Sager, uh, Micrim, you know, any of the popular RTOSs and such, they are all supported inside of our systems. Um, and so, um, but QNX is definitely one of the, uh, one of the ones that we are very tight with and, you know, they are walking distance from our office. And I just pulled up a list of the uh, the basic the runtimes that we include in our standard desktop um, install. This this is by no means uh, a complete list. This is just what we include as standard. The more um, the more common ones. And you can see here, as I was mentioning earlier, Linux and ARM and software render, OpenGL. We've got QNX six point five, six six, seven. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's. It's uh, it's something that uh, we're able to do. If if it's not in this list, then uh, please do contact us. But uh, yeah, we've we've got many of them. Okay, let's see. The next question I can probably do this is: so, what were the advantages of using containers here instead of a traditional process? So, with Horizon, like we said, it's a very minimal Linux OS, and I guess just in general, most companies will provide with their hardware some kind of evaluation, Linux image or operating system. And of course, for most cases, or not for every case, this evaluation image will not necessarily have everything you need to start building your application depending on what you're trying to do, which in a traditional workflow would mean you would need to either edit the Linux kernel or maybe on a greater scale edit the entire Linux image, which if you're familiar with embedded development typically means you need to mess around with the build system, probably the Yocto build system. And anybody who's worked with the Yocto build system could probably tell you that it's not a very nice learning curve. So what we try to kind of do here with Horizon is eliminate a lot of that prerequisite knowledge needed to develop on embedded devices. So with Horizon, you just have your very bare minimal Linux OS. And then using containers, you almost use it as a kind of a package management system and pull in a container that has your required libraries for your application. So for example, in the demo, Gary pulled in some crank specific containers that had crank libraries and runtimes that weren't on the base Horizon operating system to begin with. And he didn't need to recompile anything. He just had to pull in a container that he made previously. And then for the future, he only has to maintain this container that has his application instead of worrying about the details of the entire OS and trying to juggle different library versions in the future or upgrade or downgrade depending on the need and the lifetime of your product. So while we don't expect containers to be the answer for everything, it's really more so for the people who are good at application development, but aren't necessarily very familiar with embedded development as a whole. So yeah, I hope that answered your question. And um, th we do have a previously recorded webinar titled Introducing Horizon that 
goes into this whole container architecture ideology a lot more in depth. And also feel free to just send questions my way if you have any further questions about the benefits of containers. Okay, see our next question for Crank is, how does Crank compare to Qt? Yeah, I can follow up on that. So we have a lot of customers uh, who use Qt in the past, and Qt is one of those, uh, um, they are a large solution. They have lots of different pieces, uh, but they were built at the end of the day. Uh, people's lineage really matters when you get into UI's uh, systems. They were built as an engineering solution. You know, they are a widget framework with a large library. They're, they're trying to change that. They realize how the world's moving and with the introduction of QML and make, they, they're all bringing a lot of different options. We are designed from the ground up for the idea of how do you work with design and engineering in a nice clean way to get the most optimal performance, um, you know, in a very, with the embedded scenario as the, the, the focus of where we are. You know, we are not focusing at the mobile market. We're not focusing at the desktop market. We have a very clean focus. Um, a lot of the customers I showed you probably in the introduction did use QT at one time and why are they with us now? They saw so much um, change in how fast they were able to try out ideas, test ideas, and build their UIs, but at the same time also the ability that we gave them to scale across from an MCU platform all the way up to the highest level uh, GPUs and CPUs out there today, and then tune the performance on those embedded systems. We use a fraction of the memory, we are a faster development pr process, and we get a, you know, uh, pretty much every test we've ever had, we do get a better performance. So um, all those solutions come together to make a very compelling offering. Right, and see, the next question, and I can take this one, is what is the minimal flash size required? So with Terizon, the typical flash size, and this does change depending on the module you're running it on, but it's about anywhere from 100 megabytes to 150 megabytes about last time I checked, though that is just for the base Terizon Core OS you still need to account for the size of your containers that you're pulling. For example, I think, Gary, you said the crank container was 150 megabytes about? Yeah, and if you add on top of that um, the, the assets, uh, on my screen you can actually see the um, the Western is 170 meg, that's the, yeah. kind of the uh, the core, and then then there's storyboard like runtimes and libraries are on top of that, it's about mm. another 214 meg. So yeah, it's, um, yeah. it's approximate, depends on the application. So, yeah, so this of course goes back to the kind of pros and cons of containers. Like I said, a container can be thought of as a lightweight virtual machine, but of course that does mean there is still a little bit of overhead compared to if you were to run this just natively on the OS and not in a container. So really you do kind of have to juggle the pros and cons of whether you really want a slim down system without containers, but then you have to juggle all the details of your OS, or you can live with having something in a container where you can just really focus on your application instead of the entire system as a whole. So, okay, and our last two questions, and they're actually similar questions, so I'll kind of combine them here. Um, how is Crank software licensed? Is it a developer license or a per device license? And can you give an idea about the amount or cost? Yeah, so Crank Software, yeah, we are definitely a commercial product. Um, we do have a developer license and we do have a license fee on the release. Um, the developer license um, is comparable to most other products in our, in, uh, in our field, um, you know, it's about, uh, 6,000 plus support maintenance on a, on a developer seat, and that's in US dollars. Uh, that would be a very generic, uh, you know, if you bought one developer license. Um, just to give you an idea. The license rights, that's hard to talk about without a scenario or understanding the system. We do have per unit fees for people doing low volume or depending on what makes it so we can do a 
like a per unit uh, license right. So you pay per the units you release. Uh, we also have buyouts and different options. At the end of the day, what really matters is we are very flexible because we have customers who are some releasing, you know, on a high end medical unit, 10 units. And I we have customers who are in the million of units as far as release. So we have to uh, be very flexible and uh, um, open to understanding how our customers work and uh, different models for how we deal with that. So it's uh, if you if you have questions a little bit deeper, we you know uh, definitely reach out to uh, sales at cranksoftware.com and we can give you a, a, what that pricing looks like in your scenario. All right, so that was the last of our questions here. We went a little bit over time, but I wanted to make sure we got to everyone's questions. So uh, thank you everyone for attending this webinar along with our partners at Crank for providing the main topic. Like I said earlier, there will be a survey at the end of the webinar. I would really appreciate if you could fill out the information there and provide feedback. And also, we both said, if you have any further questions that you think of later for either us or Crank, please let either company know, and we can get back to you on that. Thank you, everybody, for attending, and have a good day.